Hello, everyone. Welcome to Measuring the Score podcast, the podcast where we offer our opinions on film scores and the films they're inspired by. I'm Chris. And I'm Leslie. Let's get started. Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Measuring the Score. Not just another episode, it's a whole new season! Yay! <laughs> there it is. Season two! <laughs> Woohoo! Alright, so normally, by now, we have a lot of episodes, uh, you know, a couple episodes already out, you know, released for you guys. So, the best way I can describe this, I'm going to do my very worst Jeff Goldblum impression. You ready? You ready for this, Dozzy? I'm kind of scared. <laughs> Life uh, got in the way. I don't think yeah. that's how that quote went. <laughs> but, no, but that is exactly what happened. Life kind of got in the way. Uh, Leslie and I both work a job, work jobs, really, and they're physically and mentally demanding. So we haven't been able to post a lot, promote a lot. And then COVID happened. That's right. We did get COVID. Well, Actually, Leslie tested positive for it. I tested negative, but I had all the symptoms where Leslie had some chest congestion and a cough and everything. Thankfully, we are both okay now. But unfortunately, one of our first guests that we had planned, he also got COVID. He had to be hospitalized. He's okay now, but that pushed our schedule back a lot. And we had to rearrange uh, our format for this season uh, because we do have some guests that will be coming on uh, in some of the episodes. So uh, it, it kind of mixed stuff up for us and it pushed our schedules back. But we are here. We are here today for our first episode of season two. Exactly. And season two, I mean, that's just crazy right there in, in itself. And we have a lot, like Leslie was saying, we got a lot of great things. We have a lot of great guests. We have a lot of great scores we're going to be talking about. A lot of great episodes. Now, I know at the end of our last season, we were talking about we were going to do a Patreon. So, <laughs> I think we got a little excited and kind of got a little ahead of ourselves and everything. I don't think we're there yet for a Patreon. Uh, I don't think the podcast is there for a Patreon just yet. Just yet. We may still do this. But we do like the idea of doing video game stuff for the podcast. So... Measuring the high score is still going to happen. It would just be part of measuring the score. So it's going to be like a measuring the score network. Yay! Bonus episodes. Yay! Yeah, yeah, basically that's what it's going to be. So this season we will have some measuring the high score episodes in here. So if you're scrolling through our feed and you see measuring the high score, don't freak out. It's still us. It's basically the same format. We're just adding video games into the mix. Same, same type of questions. We're going to talk about the video game music. And then the video games itself. Our first first episode for that is Mega Man 2. My ultimate favorite. Yay! I think, well, it just has the best music. It really does. I'm old too, so, you know. (laughs) I'm not too far behind you, so, you know. Well, I'm still older. (laughs) That will always be. You will never catch up. Uh, That's that's true. (laughs) That is true. Never. No. No, I never will. (laughs) That's the unfortunate truth of life. <laughs> that, that really is. That is a an, an very unfortunate truth. <laughs> All right. So real quick before we start getting into this episode, because I am very excited about this episode. Of course you are. Yeah, and we'll get to the reason why. Um, there were two soundtracks released, um, Uncharted and The Batman. Now, The Batman is by Michael Giacchino, and he is becoming a ultimate fan favorite well actually i'll just say like he's becoming a a ultimate favorite with this podcast i i'm starting to like him more and more i i'm serious I, this he's in your top five yeah he's definitely in my top five i mean because god i mean that score man now you listen to part of it you listen to some of the batman score what was your initial reactions to that this? it was amazing uh that it had a lot of old school kind of elements to it it sounded more 
symphonic to me. I didn't, he- granted, the pieces that I heard, I didn't hear any synth or anything. It sounded more organic, and I kind of like that fact that it sounded uh, like an old school score. Uh, and it, it really does. And he created this theme for Batman that sounds almost like the heartbeat for the entire score. I mean, you hear this theme pretty much predominantly throughout the entire thing. And it's a it's a long score, too. It really is. I know the piece that I was listening to um, at the very beginning, I don't know the name of it, but the way that uh, the tone was, it reminded me of bats uh, flying about. It was really... Uh, erratic sounding so I could visualize I think some of the stuff that was going that's going on in the movie even though it hadn't been released yet so I'm kind of excited about seeing the movie as well uh that that piece was called can't fight city Halloween see there you go he, he always has snappy little he does I really I, like I the name it. of his stuff uh, I do too and, and like I said he, he he's becoming a a major favorite with this podcast he really is and he, he just seems like a heck of a nice guy. Now, the next soundtrack I was talking about was Uncharted by Ramin Jawadi. Oh, man. Do we have to talk about that one? <laughs> we do. We do. Now, look, look. I am a big fan of Ramin Jawadi. Uh, he comes from Hans Zimmer's group at Remote Control Productions. I really like his stuff. Um, there, there are a ton of scores that he has done that I still listen to. Pacific Rim was one of them. I, I, I love that. I love that score. I really do. I was very excited for this because I am such a big fan of the Uncharted video game scores by Greg Edmondson, and I really love what Henry Jackman did with Uncharted 4. Uncharted 4 has this really, one, one of these score cues that I'll, I'll play it, and I'll, it's one of those that I'll sit there and rewind, 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 because I, I keep wanting to listen to this one part. Now, the Uncharted games have a very specific theme. It's a very action-adventure-oriented theme. It sounds like something, it's not really like Indiana Jones or anything. It just has a very soft, melodic tune. Now, if you, you know, you're trying to understand what I'm talking about, go and listen to it on Spotify. Just type in Greg Emerson, Uncharted, whatever. You'll find it and listen to it. It's called Nate's Theme. And he, he for each game that he did, because he did 1, 2, and 3, it's Nate's Theme 1.0, 2.0, 3.0. And then uh, Henry Jackman did his own, and he still incorporated that theme. So I was thinking, okay. Ramin Jawadi's going to incorporate that theme. It's going to be great. It's going to be, you know, he's going to have his whole action-adventure thing. First track starts up. It's called Uncharted, and it's not it. It's not the Uncharted game theme at all. And the theme that's there, it's so generic. Yes, that was my feeling. Very generic and blah. Yeah, it's very bland. It's very generic. It, and it, it does not, it's not cohesive. It wasn't, it sounded like it wanted to fall apart in places and it just was not interesting to me. It would lack some of those integral layers you would think that you would hear, uh, you know, in an uncharted type of score. Um, you know, I, I'm not saying sound like full blown Indiana Jones because, you know, there's only one John Williams when you start right. talking about that sort of thing. But there were elements from um, some of the video games you could have added in there. Uh, that wasn't, you know, when I heard it, and I was just very unimpressed. There there were a lot of moments in there where he had a lot of synth, a lot of guitars and everything else, which sounded, you know, it had a nice sound to it. it was, I was like, okay, I can kind of get into this. And then he brought in that theme that he created, and it did not work what it what was there. And you would think that you would, granted, if I was a composer, which I am not, I would try to add something uh, from that environment. So you're dealing with Uncharted, you're dealing with Adventure, I would not have added synthesizer to that. No, I would. I would have added that. maybe drums and some organic sounding instruments to that. Now, granted, it may work for the film. I don't know. I haven't seen it yet. I'm not really too excited for the film because of the cast. I mean, don't get me wrong. Tom Holland, he's a great actor. So is Mark Wahlberg. But I'm sorry, they are not Nate and Sully. They are not those characters from those games. I do not think of Nathan Drake and you know Sully. When I look at those two, I understand it's an origin piece. I get that. I understand it's a prequel to the games. I understand all that, but I just, I still don't see those two actors as those characters. And from the way it sounds, it, the film is kind of faltering from that. And, and the score as well. The score it could have been so much more. I was really looking forward to it. Again, it's nothing against Ramin Jawadi. This is, you know, this is just our opinion and everything else, but very disappointed. Uh, but hey, 
everybody listening to this, go listen to them. Go listen to those scores. Let us know what you think. Let us know on Twitter, Facebook, send us an email, whatever. I mean, because maybe it's just our opinions. There may be a lot of people out there that really like, you know, the, what they did. You know, and if you, you do, let us know. I mean, no judgment. We would love to hear from you. Exactly. So now the reason why I'm excited for this episode. We're going to be talking about one of my favorite films of all time. Yeah, it's up there with Twister and oh, Jurassic yeah. Park. Oh, it's right I would up say there. his top three. Oh, it's definitely in my top three, buddy. Today, we're going to be talking about Tremors by Ernest Troost and additional music by Robert Falk. Now, I had no idea that uh, Ernest Troost did not score the entire thing. Yeah, you know, I... I... Now, granted, I have not seen Tremors in a long time before uh, this episode, and I never realized that it was two different composers. Well, it, they it wasn't known. It always said music composed and conducted by Ernest Troost. So I was like, wow. And, and that was the thing, too. It, I, I heard this music and everything else, and I'm thinking, why have I ever heard of this guy that much? Why hasn't he done more? Because that was a great score. Well, because it wasn't all him. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I'm not saying that's a bad thing. I, I, I'm not talking bad about the guy uh, because he, he did create a lot of good score in there. Uh, but the the bigger, more cinematic pieces were not him. And I'm like, oh. So basically, they hired Ernest Troost to do the score. Ernest Troost only had, if I recall, was it four weeks. Yeah. Four weeks to write the score of the film. And he also didn't get to watch the pre-recorded stuff beforehand to try to figure out the score. There was no meeting uh, in the very beginning with the director. So he was kind of writing it blindly. Um, the director loved the direction that Troost was going in. He loved the, the Troost feel if the original score. But then he felt like after the screening that it was still lacking. And Troost's schedule was already booked with something else. So then yeah, he brought it, in... I think Ron Underwood, the director, because we're, we're, we're kind of paraphrasing from the uh, booklet that was included in the La La Land record. Now, this score was never released publicly for the longest time. I mean, it was what? This has been 30 years since... I mean, it's 19... Uh, the movie was made in 1989. It was released in 1990. So do the math. You're better at that than me. <laughs> <laughs> You're putting me on the spot. I'm putting you on the spot, buddy. But no, Ron Underwood said that um, <laughs> he he loved what Truce had done. They went to like a very small studio, and he, he loved the direction that Truce was going in. Now Truce was having to work with um, a, a lot of temp music. There was like Brian May's score was in there. I think there was some other different scores in there. And he he even said it was a rookie mistake of what he'd done. He should have went more with his. Uh, gut feeling and and incorporated bigger, bigger themes and everything else and like again i'm paraphrasing here but it, it, he was he understood what they were saying when it needed to be bigger but unfortunately his schedule was already already booked and even though he did want to come back um he couldn't so they got robert falk now i was thinking robert falk who, who do where do i know this name from Police Academy. Exactly. Police Academy. <laughs> and, and if you if you stop and think about it for a moment, Police Academy, that theme, I mean, it's a very iconic theme. Love that. But it's very big, very brass. And the score with Robert Falk in there, there's a lot of brass in there. So he, he really likes working with brass, and he, and he does a great job at creating themes and, and melodies, you know, melodic themes. It just works with, you know, what he does. A lot of layers. A lot of layers. So both scores were utilized for the film. And so we sat down and we listened to both scores. So um, my initial impression with uh, both of the scores that were used was that um, Folk, he indeed did have the more cinematic sound. He had many layers to his music. You can hear all the intricate layers. It made it sound more in depth and full. Where uh, Troost, his was kind of lackluster in that uh, he didn't have as many layers as Folk. I can see why they brought Folk in uh, just by listening initially. And uh, then, you know, Troost, he did create this 
country western sound, which Chris will elaborate on in a minute. But um, you could definitely hear that style versus the style of folk, which is more cinematic. You know, folk used all the trumpets and the violins. You could really hear the difference uh, between the two. Uh, Also, when listening to the truth score, some of those pieces sounded really dark. Oh, yeah. Now, th- that was something about True Score, listening to it, I-, I did notice. Like, his score, the the country western stuff, is, is like... The lighthearted. Ba- yeah, the lighthearted country, you know, it sounds like a country song playing and everything else. That works great for Val and Earl with their witty banter and everything else, which we'll, we'll get to that when we start talking about the movie, because we got a lot of stuff to talk about with that movie. Uh, but no, it, with the witty banter and everything, it works. It works great for that. That's basically Val and Earl's theme, and... Every time that starts up, you're automatically like, yeah, okay, this is going to... And Leslie brought up a good point. It sounds like something from a sitcom, and it does. It has a A a cinematic sitcom. Yeah, a cinematic (laughs) sitcom theme, sound. You know, that's that's the type of sound it has, and it works. It works fantastic for the movie. But And a lot of the softer, slower, scarier, tense moments, Truce's score is there, and it works. It works fantastic. It works great in giving the mood, the setting, the tone, and everything else. But when his score does not work, is for the bigger action moments, for the scenes where the big graboids are happening. And, and that was something I, w- I was very excited about when I got this CD, which my lovely co-host got for me for my birthday, uh, I think, last year? No. Year before? I think so. Yeah, Maybe think the year, year before, before that even. No, it was a year before that. Yeah. It's been a while. Yeah, it has been a while, but I was very excited and curious to to hear the differences because I didn't know about Robert Folk scoring trimmers until a couple of years ago. And when I when I learned this, I was like I was like, Well, that makes a lot of sense why I haven't heard of Truce that much. I'm not saying he's a bad composer or anything like that, but that was the reasoning. Now, Falk wanted to go uncredited. He he did not want credit for this. And he, he has said that, um, I read this somewhere on Twitter, I can't remember where, um, that uh, Falk said that uh, it was one of the hardest things he's ever had to do was score Tremors. And he went uncredited and Troost wanted to share credit with him. Troost was a little unhappy because, um, you know, a lot of his score was unused. And rightfully so, I would have been too. I mean, I would have been upset, but he understood because his schedule was really tight and everything else. And he was wanting to share credit with Robert Falk. It sounds more like Falk was, he didn't want to have a credit there out of respect for Troost. I, I don't know, I, I can't guarantee this or nothing like that, but that's just, that's just my opinion. It sounds like he, you know, felt bad for what happened, felt bad that he had to come in and kind of, beef things up so he wanted truce to have sole credit that's how it sounded so then you know as we're listening to the score i heard folk he brought in this motif for the graboids and you could tell um and he was really consistent with it you could hear it in the score initially that was lacking from truce's original score he basically gave the graboids a theme he did he which is the on it's a uh Ongoing like a, motif. It sounds that... like a bunch of shakers with the echo delay. It's like now I would play the clip, but I, I this this is just right here, right here, right now. I I'm at this point in the podcast. I I don't think because we don't have a sponsorship. I'm I'm very hesitant about using music clips. I know we did it for our Jurassic Park episode, which worked, but we did get a licensing thing on the YouTube video showing that we used the music from Jurassic Park on there. And that kind of gave me a little cause for concern right then and there. So at, at this moment in the, in the podcast, in this stage, we're not going to do music clips. So I would play it, but unfortunately, but you can find this music, YouTube, Spot, Spotify, Apple, anywhere. La La Land record. Yeah. You know, La La Land. Please go buy the CD. I mean, cause it, it is a absolute joy to listen to. It really does. It has a lot of great moments in there. And like I said, I would play the play the shakers, the grab boys theme, basically. But, you know, that's the reasoning. So why. there is a as we just said, there is a motif in there for the, the grab boys and it is ongoing. But it wasn't from Troost. It was actually from Folk. Um, uh, Troost score is very reminiscent in places of Jaws. 
Uh, it kind of had a nautical feel to it. Um, you've got this unknown creature, supposedly, you know, in the movie. Um, but his score itself has a nautical feel. And so you could hear it uh, in certain places. Um, and it does. It puts you in mind of, of, of Jaws. And it, it really does. And I think one of the alternate uh, titles for the film was Land Sharks, which, again, that makes a lot of sense for Truce to have. Yeah, you're skipping ahead. I wrote down the oh, titles. <laughs> but that's okay. I'm sorry. I didn't know you had that in your title, in your notes. I'm sorry. I, I'm a terrible co-host. No. Well, and But it makes a lot of sense, though, because Truce, there, there were, Truce used a lot of strings. Now, he did have some brass in there. He had the, uh, the wonderful use of heart. I mean, the harmonica and the harp. Jeez. I'm thinking of Joel Harp with uh, Robert Fault. Uh, I'll talk about that in a second. But no, he had the harmonica coming in there a lot and everything else. And he did have a theme throughout the the film that he was using. But it was kind of hard to pick up on a recurring motif that right. Fault uh, kind of put in his music. So um, you could hear the improvements right away, list, you know, listening to the two different scores without watching the film. Oh, definitely. Definitely. And I don't know. I mean, I I really wanted to like what Truce, a lot of the stuff that Truce did, but there were a lot of moments in there. I'm going, no, that just really didn't work. Like for the Graboid reveal, uh, for like when the horses stop and, and this whole thing, what Truce did, it was a lot softer. It was not big and over the top like it should have been. I mean, because this is your first moment where you get to see the giant Graboid. I mean, it just took down a horse and everything else. It's a big, huge moment. But the music there was just, it was very lacking. It was just, there was not a lot of, ah, man, I don't know, tension. There was not a lot of uh, action. Layers. Yeah, there was not a lot, not a lot of lacking layers. Lacking layers in depth. A lot of layers. So then when you when you hear what Robert Falk did, it was like, this is what was should have been there. Folks. Uh, he had a really good um, grasp on creating movements. Um, he had some uh, action pieces, which you could tell instantly by listening to him that there were action pieces because uh, he used his runs. Anytime you hear the use of runs, you know that there's something going on action-wise. Which I got to um, say, I got to interrupt you on that one. I really love the runs. Yeah, uh, though, uh, That didn't sound right. <laughs> Christopher Bruce. <laughs> Oh, I just showed how amateur I am on this podcast. Yes, you did. <laughs> I love the use of the My orchestral... seven-year-old husband. <laughs> the orchestral run movements that he had. From yeah, the... I, don't, I do not <laughs> I like... I can't recover from this one. <laughs> is your face turning red? I think it it's is. turning red. It is turning red. <laughs> wow, I can't believe that. Right when I said it, I was like, oh. <laughs> so, <laughs> he did create some movement. And you can hear it in the music where um, Troost kind of, his score, I think that if it was utilized in the film, and I know I'm jumping ahead a little bit, it would have slowed the movie down pace-wise. Uh, to me, the pacing was a little off. Perfect example when uh, Kevin Bacon's character, Val, is running from the from Chang's market and he's, he's doing, you know, he's got the suicidal attempt where he's going to drive the bulldozer and everything else. And he's running what Troost has there. It's like a little bit of a theme. It's kind of heroic sounding because Valentine, you know, he's going to save the day and everything else. And then the Graboid shows up, you know, and what was still going with there was just like that heroic theme and then like a little bit of movement with the strings and everything else. But it was like there, it should have been bigger. And I'm, as I'm listening to this, I'm like, what scene should have this have been? So I'm looking at the title and I'm going, what? This is for the scene where Val's running across from the grab. No. How would that have worked? So let's talk about the last piece. Uh, because they do have uh, the last two pieces uh, on uh, the score credit. Yeah, final confrontation. Right. So the difference between those two, you could really see the difference in the styles between uh, both, um, both composers. Uh, one... Uh, Troost, guys, I knew I was going to mess up the names. I'm going to get them mixed up. I'm trying not to, so that's why you hear me pausing. 
Uh, in true score, it really doesn't sound like a grand finale, the, no. the final fight. It, it's, it's, it misses the mark, I feel, on that point. I hate to um, keep saying lackluster, but it's true. It's just it wasn't there. Yeah, it, it, it seemed like it kind of missed the, the premise that this is the final fight, you know, and that they're um, fighting for their lives. Uh, where the, the track title itself is Final Confrontation, and it sounds like it should have been for the scene where Val's running through the desert away from the <laughs> grab uh, And I'm being serious because it's like the he's got the 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 low bra- uh, low bass strings, you know, and it sounds like you know the shark coming to take down Bro- you know Chief Brody and everything else, which sounded great. Don't get me wrong; it had a great sound to it, but it's it's not the final confrontation. Yeah, it does not sound like something that you would hear in a, a final fight scene in in a film. Uh, then when Folk, when you listen to his piece, it w- it just fit perfect in my opinion as a, a you know finale uh, between man and beast. You know, it fit nicely. It, it it really did, and I mean, it was just full of energy. Yeah, that's a, that's a perfect way of saying it right there. It was full of energy. It it was uh, it had a ton of movement. When when you're listening to it, you're like, yeah, yeah, this is this is going to happen, and it builds up quite nicely to the to the you know the lovely sounding bells of the gravaway going you know over the cliff and everything else, and it works. It, everything just fit perfectly together with that, you know, with what he did. Uh, one of the things that Ron Underwood said that he was he was. Uh, upset to do, you know, to take truce, a lot of truce score away. But he also said that the mirroring of the two and the way the both scores fit into the film worked almost perfectly. I, I got to tell you, I, I got to give my, you know, I got to tip my hat to the music editors or, or just the editors, you know, whoever, whoever was in charge of putting those scores together, they did a wonderful job. Well, it's not just the editors. I think Folk did a phenomenal job trying to match uh, what he had to write with what Trist had. And, um, you know, being a composer like Chris is, Chris could be the first to tell you that it's difficult to match. He's had to match pieces before um, for some of the films that he's worked on. And I, I think that, uh, you know, it's kind of the sign of a master to to be able to do that. Because I know for starters, I would not be able to. I'd be all over the place. As a composer, if I was asked to come on and say, hey, look, we need you to beef up the action moments and everything else. But, uh, you know, create kind of your own style and everything else. Just beef up what was already there. I would be like, oh, I, I, I don't know what to do. I don't know how I'm going to do this. And, and I don't know how Folk pull, pulled it off, but he did. And he did a really great job. And I think that was very, if that is the case of he, he didn't want credit to kind of, you know, tip his hat to truce and everything else. Um, I, th- I think that's great. You know, I, but I really do wish that Folk had been credited because, I mean, I know Truce himself said that he would love to share credit with him. And I think that should have been the case. I think it should have been music composing conducted by Robert, you know, Ernest Troost and Robert Falk. I think, I mean, I don't know the official reason why he did that. I think he should have been credited. I mean, what, what do you think? No, I agree. Uh, credit is due. Um, you know, I, I mean, he should have been credited with that. But then again, uh, he, he seems kind of modest in the respect that he didn't want to be credited. So, you know, you can't slide him for the modesty there. Yeah. He was just trying to help out a fellow composer. Yeah. All right. So now the film itself. So as Chris mentioned before, the film came out in 1990 and there were three working titles at the time when it came out. Uh, Dead Silence. Oh, man. I'm glad they didn't use that one. Beneath Perfection. (laughs) And Land Sharks. See, Land Sharks. That's funny. Casting was done through open auditions. However, um, Valentine's role was offered to Bill Paxton. Oh, I didn't know that. Yes, Matthew Modine. Oh, no. And Bruce Campbell. <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine you, Bruce Campbell? <laughs> are you serious? It was offered to Bruce Campbell? Yes. I didn't offered. know that one. So they, but they, then oh they decided to go with Kevin Bacon. Oh, hold on, hold on, <laughs> hold on. I, I got to... I... <laughs> <laughs> Chris has got to process this, guys. Uh, hey, hell to the king, baby. Bruce Campbell could could have played Valentine McKee. I don't know. I could see him playing Earl. <laughs> no. 
Earl Bass's character. <laughs> Jack Palance. You mean Fred Ward's character? Earl Bassett. Okay. His character was. No. Fred Ward's character. Earl Bassett is the character. Yeah, I know. But his character <laughs> was offered, or not offered, rather, he was considered Jack Pallant. Pallant. I Jack Pallant. Uh, yeah. I could see that. Yeah. He was considered. Which is funny because Ron Underwood directed Tremors. Uh, Jack Pallant's, you know, he considered Jack Pallant's for that. So, but then he directed um, City Slickers, which... Jack Palance was in, or Jack Palance, however you uh, pronounce it, in which he won an Academy Award for that. So, if Jack Palance, or Palance, however you pronounce it, uh, had done Tremors, maybe he won an Academy Award for that movie. Now listen. Oh, God. The writer imagined the role of Bert going to Chuck Norris. (laughs) Or Clint Eastwood. (laughs) And instead, they get Family Ties, Michael Gross, which is crazy to think, because could you see... Chuck Norris continuing this franchise into number seven with, you know, what, Trevor's uh, Shrieker Island? <laughs> no. Chuck Norris wouldn't have done it. He would have stopped it, this one right here. No, he, he couldn't have done it. The Grab Boy would have been afraid of Chuck Norris, and then the movie would have never happened. <laughs> the animatronics wouldn't have worked. Be like, oh, it's Chuck Norris. It's Chuck Norris. Let's not work. <laughs> so. <laughs> Sorry, I, I still can't get over Bruce Campbell. Yeah, that's funny, right? God, that's This hilarious. is my boomstick. <laughs> Anyway, um, various sounds Man. of the Graboids, uh, after this movie came out, you could hear those sounds in a few films like Predator 2, Starship Troopers, Ants, Mosquito, Eight-Legged Freaks, and Kong Skull Island. So that sound that we that's you hear in the movie that the Graboids is making, you can hear also in those other movies. That's, hairy, that, that's hairy, uh, hilarious uh, about the Predator because in Tremors 2... You get introduced to the Shriekers, and they have heat vision. So that's fu- and even in Shriekers, uh, uh, Tremors, uh, Shrieker Island. Yeah, I know. Uh, uh, God, what's his name? Uh, John Heater's character. He's a oh, like a heat vision. Oh, like Predator. So that's funny. Yeah, that, that's bit, that is really funny. The Easter egg there. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so speaking of Easter eggs, so since we're talking about the trivia of the movie and everything else, I want to go ahead and spoil it right now before you do. Reba McIntyre's in the movie. And the scene where the station wagon is getting eaten by the graboid, uh, the the doctor and his his wife are getting, you know, they're getting killed. The song that starts playing, if you listen closely, that's Reba McIntyre singing. Yo, Mr. Mister, I didn't write that down, fancy pants. So, ha. <laughs> so, you got to say it anyway. Yay. So, um, when you start watching the movie, the first piece that is heard is actually the part of the true score. It's that country western sound that you hear, uh, and it's between the dialogue between Valentine and his buddy. Yeah, Val peeing on the side of the cliff, which is funny because you know that's the same cliff that you know the grab boy goes flying off. I didn't pay attention to that. Yeah, yeah, I, I think it is. I, I could be wrong. Yeah, I didn't pay that close attention to it. I, I, it looks like the same cliff. I but, could be wrong. I could be wrong. <laughs> but that at the very beginning, you heard, you know, truth score. And uh, the country western theme, as Chris mentioned, and I've said before, uh, not on the podcast, but I've said before to him, that it was very reminiscent of sitcom, comedy, you know, laughing. And they have this banter going back and forth at the beginning. And... Uh, that score reflected that, and I think it did a very good job, uh, very good job with it. It, it does, and, and it fits the characters. It fits their banter and everything else, which I, I got to say, it was some of the most perfect casting of Kevin Bacon and Fred Ward, because you wouldn't think those two would work the way they do, but it, they do, and they have you know great banter between the two. They play off each other well. It was really uh, it's still, I've seen this movie a million times, maybe more than that, and it was still fun to go back and watch it. The chemistry it. between them two—they have great. such great chemistry. They but really the do. irony, <laughs> the irony behind it is that Kevin Bacon felt like he was at all time low in his life. <laughs> his wife was pregnant uh, with their—I think it was their third child—and uh, I think. If I remember reading the trivia correctly, there was a moment where he said that he just kind of fell to the ground like, why, why am I recording a movie about worms? He was very upset <laughs> about that fact. But then hindsight, he will say now that it was the the best time you've ever had on a movie set. So 
in the end, he did have fun on the set. Uh, but at the time, he was just at an all-time low. I guess he felt like that was a low point of his acting career, was <laughs> acting in Tremors. Well, which is crazy because, you know, he said he had a lot of fun with this. but And then, like, you know, 30-something years later, he tried to come back to the series. He tr- it, it, it wasn't, it was a, it was going to be a reboot, basically. It's going to make a sequel straight to the original. So it was going to ignore two through seven and just start its own thing and everything else. Unfortunately, the pilot, it didn't get past the pilot phase. And uh, it was, the trailer was released online and it, it looked really good. It looked really fun and everything else. I Even Kevin Bacon was still stumped as, as to the reason why it didn't make it. It didn't, it didn't become a TV series. I think it, they should just go ahead and release it to see what the fans think. Uh, I think it would have been great. Uh, maybe Netflix should have picked it up. But I know they took it to Amazon and they took it to Sci-Fi, which there at Sci-Fi is when it was ultimately killed off, so to speak. And, and you know, it's a shame. So that means that everybody had a lot of fun on this movie. They had a lot of fun making it. And, I mean, that tells you something right there. When Kevin Bacon wants to come back to the franchise, you know, 30-something years later and say, hey, I, I, w- I want to play this character again. Yeah, he, in hindsight, I think he had a great time, even though during the recording, he wasn't so happy. Right, right, and, and that's that's funny because, you know. So, um, you hear this lighthearted piece at the very beginning, you have this uh, comedic moment between the two lead characters, and then all of a sudden, it gets very serious. Right. There's a transition to seriousness when they found um, the first body. Uh, that transition, you can't tell that it's two different composers. No. It's very seamless. It sounds like it's one and the same, that it's part of the, the same score. And um, it was done lovely. The, the transition there was. Well, I mean, like I said before, I had no idea that it was two different composers for the longest time. Because for one, you know, Falk wasn't um, credited. But they did such a great job of, of, you know, putting the two in there. And I, I got I to gotta tell you, I mean, going back and listening to it and knowing where the parts were of true score compared to folk score, it was still still kind of hard to, to pick up, you know. And distinguish between the yeah, two. Yeah, it was really hard to distinguish between the two because they, they you know, the, both the composers – did such a great job. The music editors, the editors did such a great job of, of, of layering those two. And there was even some moments in there where True Score was on top of Folks or Folks was on top of Truths, and, and it worked. It worked perfect. Yeah, you couldn't tell the difference. And then, you know, as the movie progressed, they find the first body, and then the, the Graboid makes an appearance. When you see the doctor scene with the Graboid, that's when you start to hear that reoccurring motif that Folk created for the Graboid. Um, it's very uh, interesting choice. I'm still on the fence about whether or not it works for the Graboid. Chris thinks it does. He has uh, a different no, really opinion. Do. I mean, and it's, it's not that I've got the nostalgia glasses on or whatever, you know, or the rose tinted glasses, however you, whatever the phrase is. Uh, or it's, it's, to me, it works because it's different. I mean, because if the movie was made now, the the type of theme you would get for the Graboids would probably be like a low brass where the pitch is shifting downwards, you know, which might would work or whatever. But no, I, I don't even think that would work. I, I really don't think so either. But that's what you would get now nowadays. Uh, so I think the shakers and the hi hat, the synthesized shaker noise, I th- to me it works because it, it symbol it, it it to me it makes me think of something under the ground and mixed with a desert. Yeah, I'm still on the fence. <laughs> I really oh, am. Oh, whatever. Well, I mean, look, you know, like in Jaws, for example, he's got an iconic theme. You hear that theme, you know the shark is coming. Um, That cue. Yeah, and I think that's what tri- truce, 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 <laughs> Oh, I, he I, sounds so Southern today, oh, guys. <laughs> yeah. It's been a while since we've done this podcast. <laughs> Uh, no, I think that's what Truce was trying to do. Yeah, he kind of fell short. So when Folk really picked did. it up and had has this motif that reoccurs that, you know, okay, I hear this. I know that there's a Graboid present. I still don't know if the choice of instrumentation works for it. I right. still feel, I'm, I just don't feel comfortable with it. I don't know why. I just don't. Okay. <laughs> 
Don't that's my that, opinion. That, you know, man, that's that's your opinion. Um, truthfully, in my in 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 my opinion, uh, um, I think I, I I'll get to that when we get to our our questions. Um, going back and like I said, I've seen this movie you know a ton of times and everything, else, and going back and watching it again for the podcast, you know, with the mindset of I need to listen to the score and everything else. I never had a moment in there going, you know, where where I wasn't entertained, it, it, where it, you know, the score took me out. I never had a moment where it, it was overpowering. Um, I, I do think, like you're talking about with the theme there, it, it kind of does happen a little too much. I think maybe that was a little bit, you know, they could have toned back a little bit. Well, you know, if they tone it back, I could see them utilizing it, you know, when the Graboid's coming. Right. Or when he's about to come out of the ground. Right. Anytime they're made reference to the Graboid, you see the sand move or you see him come up out of the ground. You see the little worms come up out of his mouth. You always hear that tone. Now, that could be why that it's kind of standoffish or, you know, why I'm kind of uncertain about it. Or it could just be the fact that the sound itself, I'm I'm uncertain about. I don't know. I just, just but there to me, there's a, um, I just don't really like it. <laughs> I just don't. Now the movie is still a ton of fun to this day. It it really is. I mean, the movie was made in 1988 89. Uh, I think it was 89 is when it was made and it was released in 1990. And it's still to this. I mean, here it is. It's 2022, and you can still sit there and watch this movie and have a big smile on your face. It still works. Even people who don't even like the rest of the films, like completely hate the rest of the films in the franchise, still like the first one. And, and again, it goes down to the casting. And now, some of the effects don't really hold up. <laughs> some of them. At least they're practical. Yes. the pract- And the fact that they're all practical. Like a lot of the shots with the worms, they, those are puppets. Those are hand puppets. Well, it's like you a know, Muppet. I think basically. that if it would have been like nowadays CGI, Which CGI they, they gets use, old quick. Well, they use a lot of CGI in the later, the newer Tremors films. I mean, and even in the because uh, Tremors was made by uh, S. S. Wilson with Steve Wilson, Brent Maddock, Nancy Roberts, and uh, Ron Underwood. Uh, they did a lot of the. Um, you know, work, but it was mainly Steve Wilson, uh, who's credited as SS Wilson and Brent Maddock were, were the ones really behind it. And, and Nancy Roberts, uh, they formed Stampede Entertainment and now they were behind Tremors one, two, three, four, and they were behind the TV series, the short lived TV series that had Michael Gross on there. Uh, like I said, that, that was Stampede Entertainment. Now they, they did a great job and everything else. Unfortunately, Universal kind of pushed them out, and then they made five, six, and seven without them, and it it did lose uh uh the practical effects. Um, there were some practical effects in there, but it was mainly a lot of CGI, and it didn't have the same feel that if you know the guys at Stampede had been involved with it. So the fact that this film they didn't rely that it was made when it was there wasn't a lot of digital effects. And the practicality of the effects still work a lo- in a lot of scenes. Now, the scene where Bert is firing away at the grab boy, and you can tell it's a screen and everything else. Because, again, it's a puppet. It's a hand puppet. And, you know, then you got Michael Gross shooting, you know, a uh, machine gun at, the, at a green screen or blue screen, basically. And you can kind of tell the shadow there. But still, it still looks great. I mean, this, this still, the, you still get a sense of what's going on. Are we talking about the first one? I don't remember that. I think you looked away. Maybe. Because <laughs> you could kind of tell where Michael Gross was standing in front of a screen shooting. And it was, there was like a shadow effect. And you can tell they just, oh, okay. yeah, the, the, the plate was there. <laughs> and you can tell that's what was going on. He was standing in front of a screen. Well, you know, the elephant gun that he used in the film, they borrowed from a local collector. And yeah. so they had to make special blanks for it That's for him to shoot. That's I, And that gun looks heavy. It does. Yeah. But I, because I, I, you haven't seen this movie in a while, it was that scene, that scene right there when the gravity comes crashing through the uh, uh, the the basement there, Bert and Heather's basement, and when the camera pans over and you see the wall of guns, you, your reaction was, "Oh my!" <laughs> <laughs> 
You you forgot about that. And I, well, it was I, really reminiscent of Beverly Hills Cop, the second one, where, where Billy, Billy yeah. had that arsenal. Yeah, like, that, we really need yeah. to talk, Billy. Yeah. yeah. I'm worried about you, Billy. <laughs> <laughs> and and that's, that was Michael Gross's character. I mean, that was Bert. I mean, he was the original survivalist. I mean. I can and, see. And, and, you know, you think of Gun Nut, you, first person you think is Bert Gummer. <laughs> And, and, you know, even in the first one, you see why. Well, was it license tag? It was um, Uzi. Oh, yeah, Uzi for you. U- Uzi for you. <laughs> and, and that was, those those track names, you know, Uzi for you, there's a track name in Truce's score and Robert Folk's score. Uh, no, not in Robert Folk, just Ernest Truce. Yeah, Ernest Truce had a, a score cue. It was called Uzi for you. And <laughs> it's still funny. I, I, I love this movie i really do it's still i'm i i that's what i was telling everybody i watched this movie sitting there with a big smile on my face like i've never seen it before i still enjoy it that much i really do i and when we announced on twitter and facebook and everything else that we were doing tremor we got a lot of reaction everybody going i love this movie i really do and it's just it's one of those classic movies that just works there are a lot of elements that just fit together perfectly and the score is one of those elements that the way they have both scores fit in there just works so i think it's about that time to get to our questions are you ready of course all right so now we did change it up a little bit for this episode for, since because we're, we're doing two composers yeah we're, so we're doing two composers we're, we're essentially doing two scores now does it work for the film Ernest truce score what was there what was supposed to be there, would it have worked for the film? In its entirety, I don't think True score would have completely worked. Um, he had elements in which uh, lacked kind of movement. They kind of stand stagnant to me, sounded stagnant rather to me. Um, he had uh, elements in there that lacked layer and depth, um, like that final... Um, score piece that we just discussed it just was not there kind of missed the mark uh however he did have some highlights that was great uh the comedy piece for example uh with the country western music that that fit the characters perfectly uh you know val and uh his buddy ernest earl earl whatever ernest, ernest Troost is the composer <laughs> yes earl that's Bassett right is the character. i knew it <laughs> i see don't laugh at me anyway um, that worked lovely between the two. Yep. Um, now as folk, you know, folk didn't have a complete score. He came in just to do, uh, certain cues. I, I think that his cues did work for what they needed to work for. Um, you could obviously tell that he, uh, had a grasp for what needed, uh, to happen. Uh, however, I think that, you know, Folk at that point had an advantage because he seen the film uh, before Truce. Because Truce, remember, only had four weeks to right. write the music and he didn't get to see anything beforehand. So I think Folk had an advantage there. Um, but And, and Truce was kind of going in blind almost. Right. So, you know, does it work for the film? I don't believe, I think that they made the right choice uh, for Truce to... Uh, uh, certain certain pieces for truce to be rewritten. Yeah. Um. But as com- combination between the two, yes, I feel like both composers did the job that they needed to do, and the score worked. I I think truce score as a whole, there were a lot of um, I don't I don't want to say disappointing elements, but a lot of elements that it could have been done better, and and they did improve upon them by getting fault. Now, I, I think it would have been very interesting to hear what would have happened, what would have come up if Truce had the opportunity to come in and have better direction from the producers, the director, and everything else, and had you know more time to uh, beef up what he had done. I, I would have been very interested to hear what he would come up with, because I know it would have had a very different tone. Uh, now, I think what Folk did was you know phenomenal. I think what you know, he brought to the table, adding in there, it worked. There are, you know, a lot of um, great things that he did, a lot of different sounds that he did. So I think it worked um, what they did. I think the mirroring, you know, the, the, the not mirroring, the, the 
merging of the two. merging of the two. Thank yeah. you. The merging of the two worked, I, I, and you know they they did a great job on that. Yeah, and so, I think folk. Yeah, I think folk really. You know, he stepped it up, and and did a wonderful uh, job trying now, to match. We're not saying that true. What Truce did was really bad because what the score that was used in there w- worked perfectly. I mean, it, it, it gave the film a great sense of depth and, uh, you know, that gave the characters a great, you know, it gave a great understanding of the characters. I mean, yeah, I think he just had a disadvantage considering, yeah. you know, what type of deadlines that he was up against. All right. So what are some of your best parts of the film? So my favorite part of the film is at the very beginning where you have Kevin Bacon's character and he is, Working on that barbed wire <laughs> fence, and he's trying to nail, you know, that uh, uh, nail part of the fence down to the post, and he missed, and he missed, and he missed, and he missed, and he finally hit the, you know, hit the nail to get the the fence nailed down. But, you know, I really like the use of score there. Um, it really did, you know, as I which, mentioned. Which I think you wrote that down. It was all ad-libbed, right? Yeah, that, that with the nail, yeah. <laughs> Him missing I, the nail. I love Fred Ward's reaction to that because he just looks over and looks back like, what the? Yeah, because he was only <laughs> supposed to hit it once, if I remember correctly. And he, he, he hit all around it and then hit the nail. It but it was funny. Thing. It had a, it added a, a humorous element there. And it kind of set to tone, I felt like, you know, for the rest of the film between those two characters. So that mixed with, you know, the use of score there, I liked it because it had that, you know, comedy, lighthearted feel to it. Yeah, it worked. It worked. <laughs> I, I don't know. I, I I love the movie so much. It's kind of hard for me to have a best, you know, part. I, I think one of my best parts, though, is also one of my favorite score pieces is when Val is running, you know. Of course, because uh, you really like those action pieces. I really do. I, I do. But <laughs> I, I really like the scene, though. I really like the scene because it's it's Val is stopped and everything else and the the graboid tentacles are moving around and they're trying to find him you know they can they know he's there and he's like moving his boot around that was kind of scary back when I, you know I watched it back in the day and it was still kind of tense watching it now because you know the the snake thing is going around his boot and he's moving his foot around trying to miss it and everything else and when he puts it down it hears it and it's going flinging for his boot again I thought it was cool and then Rhonda you know, knocks the water and just causes the sound. I thought it was great. Uh, I, it was a really fun moment, fun scene. I thought it was cool. And and the music that Folk had there was just phenomenal. I loved it. And like I said, that was one of my favorite favorite score pieces, and it's also one of my favorite scenes. I'm like, what is it about tentacles and boots that make us scared? Was it that movie that came out with Lou Gossett Jr.? Was it Enemy Mine and that thing, that thing came out oh, of the... God. Was it the pit that kind of looked I, like a worm-like I thing? Really didn't, yeah. Grabbed his leg, and I'm like, what is it? <laughs> Grab Boyd. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But that's what it kind of... I was reminiscent of that in that movie. With now, those tentacle things. Yeah, yeah. And like the word Michael Gross, you know, Bert gets... His leg. Snagged. Yeah, it's just. Yeah. All right. So, what could have been done differently? Now, this one is going to be kind of hard because they did do it differently. True score was a lot of it was taken out, so and it had it replaced. So it that's kind of a kind of a hard question to ask. I mean, what could have been done differently? <laughs> well, now I I think we need to approach it like this: What could have been done differently from what we heard on the film? Yes, exactly. That's what I was about to say myself. Um, the way that I look at this question, I look at it at, in its entirety. So I look at it at, as both Troost and Folk score, the combination of the two. Right. And granted, you know, I just kind of mentioned this earlier uh, in the episode that I really don't like that that cue uh, that's supposed to signal the graboid, that, that uh, motif that he utilizes. That sound to me is just irritating. <laughs> I don't like it. It's just irritating. <laughs> I wish he could have just picked something different. It made a different noise. Uh, a different cue there. Yeah. Yeah, I can see what you're saying. I can see that. It just irritated me. That Maybe I'm looking at it from a nostalgia point of view, but I I don't see where they could have done anything different. I just found it irritating. Maybe that theme right there could have been used a little less... Um, maybe that would have helped out a little bit. I, I, I kind of see what you're talking about. I, I mean, they did use it quite a bit. Maybe tone that down just a little bit. But I overall, I think the score 
was was great what was there what was used i think it was fun i think it was energetic it, it worked it had a lot of movement uh you know what was there what worked what didn't work i mean it, it the what was presented on screen was 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 great to me i mean in my opinion and, and I mean, again, the score, it's it's now available, Spotify, YouTube, you know, go listen to it. Tell us your thoughts. Tell us what you think. You know, were we right? Were we not right? You know, was a true score better? Was folk score not as good? Let us know. And uh, as always, you can find us on Facebook. You can find us on Twitter. You can find us on Instagram. You can send us an email, measuringthescore at gmail.com. I mean, we love to hear from you guys. And, you know, we've got a lot of great stuff playing for this season. I'm kind of excited for a lot of our episodes. I am as well. We got a lot of great movie. scores coming out. We we yeah. I'm 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 very excited. And and I'm also excited to do um measuring the high score. That's gonna be fun. Yes. I I mean that it, it's gonna be interesting because when we when we talk about the game, it's it's gonna be not like with the movie, you know, it's, we would sit there and watch the movie. No, no, we're going to play the game. We're going to talk about the handling. We're going to talk about the controls. You know, does the music work for the game and everything else? It's going to be fun. I can't, you know, I can't wait. Okay. <laughs> Leslie's just got her skeptical face on. We're going, what now? <laughs> handling the controls. Yeah, the controls. You know, how does the controls work for the game? Yeah. Very slowly. <laughs> <laughs> Well, guys, we are excited to be back. We're excited for this new season, if you can't tell. Um, and like I said, you know, as always, you can, you know, reach us, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. I'm mainly on Twitter. Leslie's on Facebook. I do the Instagram every so often. You can send us an email. You can leave us a review on Apple. You know, that's great. We love to hear from our fans, you know, uh, we we may have some merchandise coming up, maybe some stickers. You know, we're, we're trying to work through the whole thing, but the the whole Patreon thing is we're we're going to hold off on that for right now. Uh, I I just don't think the podcast is there yet. Uh, I think we like I said, I think we got a little excited about that because it's like, ooh, we can do this. Uh, so yeah, unfor- you know, we're going to kind of like hold off a little bit. Um, so have you got anything else you want to add for this? No, I do not. Um, I did enjoy this episode as Chris just mentioned uh i'm also excited about uh this upcoming season uh, we got a lot of good uh um good uh uh scores uh lined up as well as some of the requests so yeah we do uh, have some listener requests. requests from last season has been woven into this season as well we got a lot of great guests that are going to be on we got a lot of great podcasters that are going to be on this season uh it's going to be fun i'm very excited absolutely So, guys, thank you so much for listening to this episode. As always, for Measuring the Score, I'm Chris. And I'm Leslie. Have a good one.